So again, thank you, Dr. Parks, for being with us. And we're so happy to have you here. And um, whenever you're ready, thanks for, thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. OK. So I'll, uh, I'll, without further ado, take it away. And I thank you all for the warm welcome and for having me back to, to talk about something that's, uh, I, I know, consumed all of our lives for the last uh, almost two years. Um, and, and yet we, we persevere and our world is changing and not necessarily in a bad way. So let's, uh, let's dive into what is the new normal in the fourth wave and what uh, has vaccine meant to, to the shape of, of, of COVID and how this wave is looking. So today we're going to try to sort of take apart the vaccine itself um, or the vaccines that we have available in Canada themselves. What are their risks? What are their benefits? How effective are they? How have they been a game changer in the fourth wave? And what does it mean if your immune system's not particularly normal for a number of reasons? So whoop, let's try that. So just to put it in context, and this is probably not a surprise to anyone, but COVID exists and it has for a very long time. It has since December of 2019 completely taken over the globe. There's not a single place that hasn't been untouched by COVID. We have hundreds of millions of cases globally that are confirmed, and there is probably many more that have not been confirmed or, uh, or under detected, particularly in developing world. So it is incredibly prevalent throughout the world. There has been millions of mortalities related to this virus. And as a, a miracle of modern medicine, right now we are very proud of saying that there's been billions of doses of vaccine given. And you can see just by virtue of the curves on the side of the, of the screen here in terms of the cases, since our vaccination rates have been going up, the huge cresting um, wave that we were seeing in the third wave in the spring of 2020, 2021 has diminished. So that is, incredibly important um, in terms of, of, of how that vaccine has changed the terrain that is COVID. If we look at Canada alone, we have uh, significant total cases we're looking at in the millions. Um, and there are about 28,000 deaths of which um, over 10,000 came from Quebec. So we have not been untouched by this. So what is new in the fourth wave and why is that concerning to us? So viruses are, you know, just like us, trying to survive and make their way in the world. And when they replicate, they're also like us. They're not very perfect. So they make mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes are to their advantage. So as they replicate their genome, there's these little tiny errors that can just by virtue of chance emerge. And those errors, if they convey any type of advantage can persist. And this is how we get variants. Variants are just the, the consequence of many, many viruses replicating. So if we have uncontrolled replication in the population, we have outbreaks that are uncontrolled, you're giving the virus opportunity to change over time, to become better, to become fitter, to become better adapted to survive in, in our population. So what we see with Delta is that it is a fast and a fit variant. It has over many, many replications been sort of the pinnacle of, of COVID variants. And why do I say fast and fit? Well, fit? well, it's more transmissible. What this means is it probably does require a, a lesser infectious dose in order to uh, create an infection in an individual. That means that if you're in a room with a person or that has Delta, um, you're more likely to get infected by that individual if you're not um, particularly immune. It's also associated with more severe disease. And this is probably because it can really bind very well to the receptors of the cells that it infects. Um, it has a higher amount of virus that can infect uh, because it is so highly contagious. And all of that means that you can get a lot sicker with it. So why is this concerning? If something is really, really transmissible, that means we need to have more people in the community fully protected in order to stop an epidemic spread, meaning a growth curve that looks like this, like is going up exponentially. 
Um, and what that means is we're probably requiring more than 90% herd immunity. If you look at the, our vaccine eligible population, which is anyone over the age of 12, that's more than 100% of that population that would be required. So even if we got everyone on board with vaccines and the vaccine worked in every single person, then we still wouldn't quite achieve that level of herd immunity. So this is something that we really need to get ahead of and having 100% of people that are eligible vaccinated is incredibly important because it puts us one step forward ahead of this virus, which is constantly changing. So we are in a race against it. So what we also see with Delta is that it has a pronounced reduction in vaccine efficacy following one dose. So people that are, mm, are kind of hesitant, got one dose and you know maybe didn't really feel on board with getting a second dose, they're not as well protected as with the ancestral strains or the strains that we had um, earlier in our waves of COVID. But the good news is the vaccine efficacy against severe outcomes is retained. So even with our, the worst of the worst of our COVID, it works incredibly well at prevent keeping people out of hospital, off oxygen, off ventilators, off any type of, of um, supportive care and intensive care, um, and make those individuals less likely to die. So it is incredibly, incredibly effective at this. And that is the really important thing. So, this is important because it not only protects individuals that completely vaccinated, even in the face of the most uh, transmissible variant, but it also protects our healthcare system because it means less people are going to end up in our healthcare walls, which means more beds for life-saving surgeries that are considered quote unquote elective. And those are things like cabbage, so bypass surgeries for hearts, cancer surgeries, cancer therapies, things that we really need to continue to go on every day as part of just you know our regular care, which might be interrupted if we end up in a disastrous wave like we saw at the very outset of the outbreak, where many of our beds were taken up by individuals that required them because of COVID. So vaccine is super effective at preventing these disastrous consequences. And when you look at the, this slide, and I know this is very, very tiny probably and very, very wordy, but what the take home message, and this is from multiple sort of, oop, it's saying my internet connection is unstable. So I hope you guys still see me. So number of different real life jurisdictions, including Canada, United uh, States, UK, um, different areas with throughout the world. What we do see is that there is retention of vaccine efficacy against preventing symptomatic and severe disease, even with Delta variant. And this is just the percentages. So it does show you that it does go to show you that even though there is that concern of a little bit less retention of, of its efficacy, it still works incredibly well. And that's even against symptomatic disease, not just severe. So what's happening in uh, Quebec right now, this slide I grabbed from the internet yesterday. It shows that our new case count for the fifth was 506 cases. But what's really important is this little bar here. And what it does show you is that if you are unvaccinated, you are more likely to be at risk for hospitalization. Or if you're incompletely, vac un incompletely vaccinated, you're more likely at, uh, to require hospitalization. And you're more likely to get infected. So even locally, what we're seeing is that vaccine works. It works at preventing infection and it works at keeping you out of the hospital. And I find this graphic more striking than just the numbers where they say, you know, you're you know, 10 times more likely or whatever. This really shows the difference. So in terms of COVID cases and in Ontario, unvaccinated, fully vaccinated hospitals, unvaccinated, fully vaccinated, ICUs, unvaccinated, fully vaccinated. So it really, the fourth wave has become the pandemic of the unvaccinated individuals that are not protected. And that is what really is populating um, our cases. That said, nothing's 100% effective. So we still see vaccine breakthrough and we'll talk about that. Now I wanna go into safety because this is a lot of concerns for people that are a bit more hesitant to take the vaccine. So what we do know is that our two available messenger RNA vaccine, this is Pfizer and Moderna, they're quite safe. We have over six months of data 
We have over hundreds of millions of doses that have been given to individuals, and it reveals no clear pattern of serious or unexpected adverse events. So it is very, very safe to take, and we've already established that it is effective. But like everything in life and everything in medicine, it's not 100% safe. There's always little risks to what we do. There's risks to me walking to work every day. There's risks to me consuming the Red Bull at the quantities that I do in order to remain awake during this pandemic. There's risks to everything within life. So messenger RNAs are reactogenic. So they're kind of less like the influenza vaccine and more like the shingles vaccine. They give you a very brisk immune response. And that's great because that's exactly what we need. We need our immune system to say, this is the blueprint of the enemy. I'm going to be prepared with all the weapons in my arsenal. So if I meet this guy, I'm going to prevent uh, my, my fortress from being raided. So that's exactly what we want. So where it's not surprising that we see a lot of reaction-like symptoms, and these are predominantly pain at the site of injection. This could be redness, swelling, and you can get some swollen lymph nodes in the armpit as well associated with that. These usually occur within 12 and 24 hours, and they resolve within a few days. Some people, particularly after the second dose, or if they're young, or if they've had prior COVID, can have more systemic symptoms. And this can include things that are what we call like influenza-like symptoms. So fatigue, fever, headache, they feel a bit achy in their joints and their muscles, they might have some chills. These also happen very rapidly and resolve within a few days, they do not persist. Occasionally, and this is more commonly seen with Moderna than it is with Pfizer, you can have a delayed response. And this is uh, redness, warmth, or itching at the site of, in, of, of the injection. This usually occurs within the two weeks um, following administration and resolves in a few days. And I actually had a hive, um, one of these delayed re responses after my second dose, um, and it resolved completely. So those are all fine, expected sort of things of anyone that's had vaccines as they've been growing up. But a lot of people are worried about more severe adverse events. So what other things have been reported? Well, the jury's still out on some of the neurological events, but there was a signal suggested in the initial phase three trials for, for some of our messenger RNA vaccines that there was a, a slightly more frequent Bell's palsy. And Bell's palsy is just a facial nerve palsy. So when your face gets a bit droopy on one side, it's generally associated with reactivation of certain viruses that we've had or we've had from when we were young. Um, and it generally resolves over time. Um, there have been follow-up studies that have looked at population-based uh, data. So FDA looked at this, um, other large uh, series in the United States and elsewhere in the world, and they said, oh, you know what, it's really hard to distinguish if there's actually a signal, because it seems like in the groups that are vaccinated and the groups that are not vaccinated, the rates of, of this paralysis or the Bell's palsy is similar between the two. So it's not really above the background incidence or background rates. Um, that said, there was a data set from Israel with about greater than 2.4 million vaccinated persons, and they found a slight increased uh, risk, but the absolute effect was small. So it's like one or two extra cases per 100,000 individuals vaccinated. So it is very, very small risk compared to the benefit that is accrued by having the vaccine. There is no cases reported or associated with these to date um, of Guillain-Barre or transverse myelitis um, in the clinical trials or the large case series, which is very reassuring because those are the some um, uh, adverse event events that we've seen with other vaccinations. So the one that everyone's talking about these days is myocarditis and pericarditis. And this is actually a contraindication to get a second dose if you've had this after your first dose. So these usually occur within one week of receiving your dose of vaccine. It's more common if you're young, if you're male, and it's more common after your second dose. In most cases, they are mild and they respond to anti-inflammatory treatments. Um, there have been very, very few cases that have required a stay in um, a cardiac uh, intensive care unit, and these individuals all uh, ended up recovering uh, completely. So there's been no significant uh, serious event to date with respect to the myocarditis, pericarditis. And the increased risk is three excess events per 100,000 persons. So this is also, again, 
very small compared to the, the benefit. So what about allergic reactions? So hypersensitivity occurred equally in placebo and vaccine groups in the initial trials. There were, have been rare reports of severe allergic reactions following the first dose since it's been rolled out in the hundreds of millions of doses. And this is about two to five per one million vaccinated persons. And if you put this into context, because sometimes numbers to me mean nothing, if you look at penicillin adverse events, it's one in 10,000 persons. And we take penicillin quite a lot. Like, I, I don't know about you, but like I've I had lots of strep throat when I was young and I was given this like it was water. So if we think about that risk, the risk of having a severe allergy to something as what we consider as benign as penicillin is much, much higher than it is to our vaccine. So it's quite safe. And to date, there's no death link to messenger RNA vaccines. These things are very, very closely followed by NACI, um, which is our kind of, uh, and Health Canada, which is our sort of governing bodies of vaccines and of any drugs within, within or any medical products within Canada. And it's also um, part of the, the uh, reporting system in the state. So they have two vaccine reporting uh, systems, vSafe and vaccine um, adverse event reporting systems. And they have not linked a following extensive investigations with autopsies um, and chart reviews any deaths that have um, occurred after vaccine to the vaccine itself. So when you look at the risks that have been sort of reported with vaccination versus SARS infection, so this is really the important thing. So if you were to choose an intervention, so you're, you're at this sort of crossroads and you're saying, okay, I'm going to put my balance down and I'm going to stick weights on, you know, if I'm going to take my risk with getting COVID or rate, uh, risks of getting vaccine, which one is going to drop and which one's going to go up? So if we look at it, so in the orange here is getting COVID, the risk of getting of these things with getting COVID. And the blue is the risk of these things with getting vaccination. So what you see is the balance really plays in favor of getting vaccine. You're more likely to have injury to your kidneys if you have COVID. You're more likely to have abnormal heart uh, rhythms if you get COVID, more likely to have clots in, uh, in deep veins or in your lung if you get COVID. You're more likely to have a bleed in your brain or a heart attack if you get COVID. And you're even more, slightly more likely to get a pericarditis or myocarditis with COVID than you are with vaccine. The only thing that you're more likely to get with vaccine is you might slightly have a shingles reactivation with vaccine more commonly than with COVID. And you're going to have lymph nodes, which we knew to begin with, um, with vaccination compared to COVID. So if I had that balance, I'm going to say, you know, 100 times out of 100, that vaccination is much, much safer than the alternative, which is to get sick with COVID. And this is the same graphic, but just presented in a different way. And I put it in here only for individuals that like to see data in a, in a different format. I know sometimes it's hard to conceptualize depending on what the image shows, but it's basically saying that your risk is much, much higher for much more things with COVID infection than it is with vaccine. So the other thing that people always are, are don't really think about because the common um, hesitant sort of way of thinking that I see amongst my patients is that, oh, you know what, I'm young, I'm going to be okay. These bad things can't happen to me, which, you know, is not entirely true because we do see young people have serious adverse uh, events to COVID if they have it. Um, but what we don't really think about and what they don't really think about is post-COVID syndrome or the so-called long haulers. It's not a rare event. And these syndromes can be life-changing. And I have seen many individuals come through my office, including individuals that are young, between the ages of 20 and 50, who have long COVID. And what they've seen or what we've seen from large case series is that it's not a rare event. So somewhere between 30 to 90% of individuals that have COVID report symptoms, one or more symptoms that persists over many, many months. And some of these can be debilitating. They could be shortness of breath that's debilitating. They can be chronic cough that's debilitating. They could be fatigue that precludes returning to work, makes it qual your quality of life absolute rubbish and your inability to get out of bed. When we look at the UK Office of National Statistics, they have a slightly more um, uh, 
lower uh, percentage that they report. So it's one in 10 individuals reporting symptoms that last more than three or 12 weeks, more common in women than men. Um, very common, so a quarter of individuals that are within the 35 to 49 age group, which they called middle age, and I take serious offense to that since I'm within that age group. Um, and also it's pretty common, one in 10 children who get COVID will have a persistent symptom. Um, so this is not a rare thing. And if we can prevent this, which is going to be the, one of the biggest consequences of the pandemic is that we're going to see a wave of individuals that have chronic sy symptoms. If we could prevent that with vaccine, that is a good thing. So vaccines, very safe, very effective, um, and we should get to them. So what, what, is, what does this mean for individuals whose immune system doesn't work? And how do vaccines affect our immune system? So I'm going to, to the immunologist that might be watching this right now, seem very, very, um, pedestrian, but we're going to put this down at my level, which is the idiot's guide to immunology, which is to say, when we are faced with a virus or any type of pathogen, we create number um, multifaceted immune response. And this can include things that are antibody based. So we create these little th um, creatures or, 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 or um, particles that go out and, and will target the infection itself. And we also elicit a cell-based response as well. And some of those responses create memory. So that's kind of the idiot's guide to immunology. And I'm sorry to the immunologists in the room. Um, so this is just to say that the memory response that's created, it can be reinitiated if we're exposed in the future. So even if we get, let's say, a dose of a vaccine and we develop antibodies to that vaccine, that antibodies might wane over time, we still have these memory cells that basically say, even though the antibody levels are down at that time, if a, the virus or pathogen comes into our system, they turn on and they say, hey, I remember you, and they start the process. They start the process of creating the cells that can cope kill the, the cells that are infected by the virus or to create the uh, target and, um, or to, to wake up the cells that create the antibodies so they can go target the virus. So it can wake up in the future. So it's a multi sort of complex, uh, there's many contributors to what creates our immunity to COVID following vaccine and also following infection. And this is just to say that there are many different sort of levels of immunity. And I thought this was an interesting sort of uh, graphic because it does show us that, you know, if we were really targeting things that would be beneficial, if we could make COVID into something that is like a common cold. So we might get it, it might be a nuisance, but it's not going to cause severe disease. What we really want to target is this stuff down here. So all of the symptomatic lower respiratory tract infections like pneumonias, hospitalization, and death. And we see that, you know, some of the contributors in terms of our immune response, like high antibody levels, they're more important for really doing the gradients that are sterilizing. So preventing infection or preventing transmission versus preventing severe disease. So when we look at what are the relative uh, arms of our immune systems and how are they preventing disease in us? We have some data from animal studies that shows that if we were to give immunoglobulin, so antibodies to naive monkeys, what we see is that over the, with the amount of antibody we give, the prevention of infection goes up. So if we give a lot of antibodies to an, uh, um, a monkey, then they're less likely to get infected with, with, uh, with COVID. So that's just to say antibody level, the, the titers or the amount of antibodies that are in the body um, can prevent uh, infection in a dose dependent form. So more is better. That said, they also looked at what happens if that amount is less, but we have cell immunity. So the, that other arm that was in that graphic that turns on over time, or that is um, attacking cells that might be infected by the virus. And what they found was that if you have this sort of waning antibody level, or you have less dose, but you have that cellular immunity, it also plays a role at preventing infection. So it's more complex than just, do you have antibodies? Do you not? And do you have high level of antibodies or do you not? There is multiple layers of our immune system that play a role 
in terms of how we prevent infection, um, how we prevent symptom, uh, symptomatic disease, and how we um, mitigate severity. What we know and what we know now, because we have over six months of data, is that that humoral response, so that those antibody levels, they decrease over time. And by six months, they've gone down um, pretty significantly, particularly in men, more than women, persons greater than 65 years of age and persons with immunosuppressive conditions. And this was in a recent New England Journal article. I put the graphics here, but the downward trend just goes to show what, what we're seeing. Similarly, this article was a group from Qatar. We're looking at the same sort of efficacy over time. So they looked at vaccine breakthroughs over time um, and, and they correlated that with waning immunity. So what they found was that the effectiveness against getting COVID, so not you might be asymptomatic, you might be symptomatic, just getting it, reached 77% at its sort of peak and it gradually declined over the course of five to seven months. And by five, seven months, it was only at about 20%. But what they did note was that the effect of against, against severe, preventing severe COVID, so requiring uh, oxygen, hospitalization, intensive care, or dying, reached 96%, and that persisted for six months. So they still found retention of that, indicating that those antibody levels alone probably aren't the entirety of that picture. So what happens when you do have breakthrough? And this is also a common question that we get is, you know, if I'm a vaccinated person and I get COVID, am I gonna give it to other people? Well, what we found is that vaccine, vaccinated people, when they're infected, they can shed virus that is culturable, meaning that it's viable virus. But the infectious viral shedding is reduced compared to unvaccinated individuals, and it tends to die off very rapidly. So we have, instead of sort of a peak like this, and it persists, 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 and slowly comes down, it's more like that. It's a, it's a, a rapid peak and a rapid decline. So they're probably infectious, less infectious for, for a smaller amount of time or shorter duration. So just to reiterate, because this was a bit of a complicated word jungle. So there's multiple components of our immune system that are required to prevent infection and illness. What we see is that the antibodies that are created by vaccine or by immunity will decrease over time. And this is more pronounced in people that are older and people that are immune compromised. What we see though, is that cellular memory. So the ability to turn back on those cells that say, hey, I got to produce all those tools, all those weapons for this war, that's maintained over time. And these are spike specific, so that, that um, piece that the, the messenger RNA codes for, spike sp specific memory B cells, they persist at six months, and even our T cells over 80 days. And what we see is that those cellular responses, they also contribute again, protect contribute to protection. Um, and this is protection particularly against severe disease. So even when antibodies wane, we still have this waking up of those cells that can actually protect us. So what does this mean for immunocompromised individuals in COVID in general and with respect to vaccine? So immunocompromised people are more likely to get severely ill from COVID. This is something we've known from wave one. They're at the higher risk for prolonged infection and viral shedding. So they tend to have virus for longer um, and they tend to shed infectious virus for longer and they can get viral evolution during infection and treatment. So this means that over time, variants can actually occur within people that are profoundly immune compromised. So because you're shedding and replicating constantly for a prolonged period of time, you might be getting antiviral therapies and different therapies to help fight the infection, the virus can make errors and change over time so we can actually have emergence of more resistant virus within those individuals, which is pretty concerning. What we know also is that individuals that are immune compromised mount a lower antibody level um, to variants as well as to ancestral virus compared to their immune competent counterparts. And they're more likely to transmit to household contacts. So even if they have an immune response from a vaccine, if they get sick, they're more likely to have, have infectious virus. So 
What we also see is that they're more likely to have vaccine breakthrough infections. And this is not surprising from the slide that I just showed you. When we look at Israeli studies, they look specifically at individuals receiving immunosuppressive therapy who had no spleen, who had chronic kidney disease requiring dialysis, and people that were transplant recipients. And they found that their efficacy was about 71% against infection and 75% against symptomatic disease. And this is really compared to 80 plus percent in the normal population. One of their follow-up studies showed 90% against effect, effect, efficacy against infection and 85% against symptomatic disease. So it's not you know, all doom and gloom for this group. Other jurisdictions did comparisons. So we see in the United States, um, people with inflammatory bowel disease, there was a reduced in effectiveness, um, but they had no comparison population. Solid organ transplants reduce effectiveness. We know that it's about 83% uh, for um, Delta in normal population. Um, in the Israeli studies, I've already sort of quoted those versus the 90, 94%. Um, in Qatar, they looked at kidney transplant recipients and they had a, a very um, uh, low efficacy against um, just infection, but a pretty good efficacy against having severe disease. Um, and those individuals that uh, were hospitalized had a, a, a blunted uh, uh, efficacy. So what does this mean in wave four? So in wave four, we were saying this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated, largely. But what we see is that a large proportion of those breakthrough cases, vaccine breakthrough cases that are hospitalized, they're immune compromised. And this is US data. So 40 to 44% of individuals that break through and require hospitalization don't have a good immune system. So the US study that shows uh, that did the comparison has a 59% efficacy against hospitalization compared to 91% in the normal population. And if we looked at specifically solid organ or um, uh, hematologic malignancies or solid organ transplants, the efficacy was only 51%. A study specific to solid organ transplants, however, said that there was an 81% reduction in the incidence of symptomatic COVID infection for fully vaccinated individuals that received an organ transplant versus those that didn't, uh, or versus those that did not receive vaccine or did not receive vaccine we're unvaccinated. So we're looking only at solid organ transplants. If you get vaccinated, you're 81% uh, less likely to have symptomatic COVID infection compared to other individuals that get a transplant that are not vaccinated. So it still does work, but it might not work as well as the normal population. And this is also, I like graphics. I find they're much more easy to understand. If we say healthy controls are about this line in terms of it, uh, antibody response after two messenger RNA vaccines, and these each are immunocompromising conditions, and the percent antibody response is kind of given in the graphic. So we see those with hematological cancers have a relatively low response because their immune system is essentially um, abnormal. Hemodialysis patients also have a less response. Those that have organ transplants, much lower, and those that are on immunosuppressive therapies can also have a lower response. So this is where the third dose comes in. So a third dose is different from a booster. A booster is something that's given when our immune system wanes over time, meaning that our antibody levels go down. So we give it a boost to, to maintain that level. A third dose is really something that we give in addition to a two dose series for individuals that might not have had a strong response to that in, initial series. And this is what is FDA authorized in the, in, in the States and is being done also here in Canada and other jurisdictions, is to give a third dose. And we have some good data for that. What they found was that if you were to give a third dose in immune compromised individuals, you have 55% um, more likely to have, in the vaccine group had an uh, antibody response. So they developed a larger number of, of anti -re um, receptor binding domain antibodies, which is just to say antibodies that are specific to that little spike protein to prevent that from going into our cells versus 18% in the placebo group. So this was a significant difference. Similarly, there's uh, four good studies here. They look at different populations. So if you were to look at second dose, those that had no serological response, 
those individuals are given a third dose, there are some that develop a response even after their third dose. So that is incredibly good. So what we see is that people that have no detectable antibody to the initial series, about 30 to 50% will develop anti-response to the additional dose. So that's extra protection for this group. Now the question is, is that third dose safe? So this data comes from uh, the Pfizer, a Pfizer rep that was presented at the, at the ACIP meeting. So it's the American version of NACI, which is our, our vaccine uh, advisory board. So what they found was that the systemic events um, were similar after the third dose than they were after the second dose. And this is just to show the, the difference in, in um, events. And another way to look at it, it's just the same. It's pretty, pretty similar um, for both Moderna and Pfizer after the third dose as it is even after um, the second dose. So when should the third dose be given? And this is a question we get with respect to timing. So FDA is suggesting that it's 28 days after the two dose initial series, um, but with respect to immune compromising conditions, what should we take into consideration? So NACI applies the same, pro, uh, same recommendations as it does to other non-active um, vaccines, which is if you're able to immunize prior to a planned immune, immunosuppression, so you're doing this in order to get the biggest bang for your buck, if possible, do the whole series at least 14 days prior to immunosuppression. This will give you um, more likely to have a robust immune response. If you can delay immunization, if the immune uh, deficiency is transient, so if this can be done safely, and this has to be done in a conversation with um, your treating physicians, then the suggestion is to delay immunization until after the immunodeficient uh, or the immunosuppression is complete. Um, so this would be three months after a chemotherapy and when cancer is in remission. But this is only if it can be done safely. If it can't, if you have high rates of, of circulating um, COVID in your community, it's always safer to get your third dose um, to have that slightly increased benefit versus to wait and, and potentially put yourself at risk for, for severe disease. Um, and with respect to stopping or, or reducing immunosuppression to permit a better vaccine response, that can be considered if appropriate. So this is, again, a discussion with your treating um, cancer doctor or treating um, a physician that's handling your immunosuppressive therapy. So generally, what we say is three months after discontinuation of immunosuppressions, this is a little bit different for anti B cell antibodies like rituximab, which can persist for six to 12 months in terms of its effect on our B cells or ability to create antibody. And for high dose steroids, it's only one month. So it really depends on the immunosuppression in terms of the delay after um, if you are waiting. But again, this is a risk benefit uh, that needs to be discussed with your treating physician. So, following vaccine, what should continue for everyone? at this present moment, given the fact that we have Delta circulating like crazy, we should continue our infection prevention measures. So this means always wearing a mask when you're out and about, maintaining two meters distance from individuals who are not within your home bubble, your household bubble, avoiding crowds if possible, avoiding poorly ventilated indoor spaces if possible, particularly when you can't wear a mask and when other people are not wearing masks, and if possible, your close contacts should be encouraged to get vaccinated. That per, per, creates a protective bubble around you. So you have individuals that are less likely to get um, significant infection. And if they do, um, they're less likely to have uh, the same amount of viral shedding for the same amount of time than the unvaccinated counterparts. So you're basically wrapping yourself in bubble wrap. So I've talked way too long. I'm going to take a sip of my Pepsi. I promise they're not sponsoring this talk. Um, and then we'll just open it up for questions. Dr. Parks, thank you so much. That is such important information. Um, I think you've answered a lot of the pre-submitted questions um, within your presentation, but I'm just gonna make sure. So I have a few questions specifically for from cancer patients looking for you know specific treatment related. When, when am I... Um, able to get a third dose, things like that. So 
Um, somebody asked, how long would you advise um, after receiving rituximab to get a third vaccine? And I think you answered that as six to 12 months, right? Yeah, in generally the, the recommendation on the um, Canadian website uh, and by NACI is about six to 12 months if possible. Um, but again, all of these sort of decisions to wait um, versus not wait have to be taken um, as a, a case by case sort of discussion with the treating team. Um, and if they ever want to reach out to any of the infectious disease or immunology um, trained individuals within, within RCS, that, that's totally welcome. And we can look at each case individually and say, hey, you know, the risk benefit weighs in this, in this direction more than that one. Okay, great. That's really helpful. Um, in and in general, it sounds like you should be waiting typically three months after finishing any kind of immunocompromising treatment to get a, either a third dose or whatever it is. Right. You can totally get the, these vaccines are safe in all immunocompromising conditions. So you okay. can get them during your, your state of immune compromise. So if you're on active treatment, it's absolutely you should get the vaccine, particularly if you're at high risk of getting COVID. So if you are in a hot spot within the city of Montreal, there's a lot of um, circulation wherever you live. It's always better to have that extra dose so you have that mounted immune response um, than to, to take that gamble and say, I'm going to wait until I'm going to have maybe a better immune response off my therapy. But that said, you know, those are all risk benefit uh, ratios. So if you're in an area where like we're back in the summertime and the, the rates are low and there, you can you know, mask and wait alone, uh, wait for a while, then uh, certainly if you wait those three months, you're going to have a more robust immune response. Okay, great. Um, any thoughts on having had allergic reactions to other drugs? Like somebody wrote in saying they had an allergic reaction to Taxol. Is it too risky for them to get the vaccine? Or are those allergic reactions so rare that it's worth the protection? Yeah, so if there's ever a concern about an allergic reaction, um, then the, the best person to, to do would be to see the immunology team here, allergy immunology team here. Um, okay. The the main things that they test for are components of the vaccine. Um, so there's specific different types of like sugars and stuff within the vaccine that they'll test for. Um, and those, uh, if you're proven to be allergic to those, then vaccine is either contraindicated if it's a, a severe hypersensitivity reaction or the vaccines given under monitoring. So right now we do monitor individuals for 15 minutes post vaccine for any allergic reaction. These tend to be very uh, rapid. And if you have had significant hypersensitivity, so an anaphylactic reaction, they extend that monitoring to 30 minutes um, just to be extra careful. And if you've had some type of reaction to your first dose, or you've had a really significant reaction, um, there are places where they can give them in a hospitalized setting. So instead of being, you know, at, at a, a pharma pre some place, um, there are there are certain hospitals that do give them. So the MUHC um, has a, an area that's, that's designed to monitor individuals that have had significant allergic reactions or the suspicion of allergic reaction. Um, so they can be watched very closely after their vaccine. And the best avenue to get to those places is through our allergy immunology department here. They've been really great. And I've sent many patients there um, with that query and they're probably sick of me by now. So if someone, let's say a patient is speaking to their oncologist, they should maybe ask for a referral to immunology um, if they have any concerns in that, in that, in that area. Yeah, exactly. To the allergy depart, immunology Perfect. department, they can, they can definitely help out with that. Perfect. What about the regular flu shot? Two questions about that. So can I have a regular flu shot two to three months after treatment? And what about incorporating a flu shot with a COVID-19 booster? Do you have any thoughts on that particular topic? Yeah, so it, that's great. I There have been, I know Moderna there was looking at doing a combination vaccine that has like flu, RSV, and, and like a little bit of uh, COVID in there. I don't know where we are in terms of vaccine development of combination vaccines, um, but certainly um, with respect to the flu shot and immunosuppression, the same rubric applies so that that you know waiting those three months you know after completion of chemotherapy and when cancer is in remission it is also the suggestion for for any inactivated um or adjuvant vaccine um so that's like 
a great idea. Um, that said, you know, many, many things are safe even in immune compromising states, um, with the exception of, of some of our live vaccines, of which uh, the influenza vaccine, unless you're getting the nasal mist, um, and the COVID vaccine are not. Okay. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions about just sort of like regular activities, letting your guard down, which sounds like just continue to wear a mask, continue to keep a two meter distance from people outside of your bubble, um, even if people are double vaxxed. Um, do you have any advice? One of our volunteers wrote in asking, you know, could given that volunteers might come into contact with unvaccinated patients, are there extra precautions that should be taken or just the general advice that you gave in your last slide? Yeah, I would say the general advice in the last slide holds true. It's really hard. We all kind of want to relax a bit. And uh, I, I catch myself in that too, wanting to take my mask off and like walk around the halls of the hospital. But it, it really, we're not at that point yet. I think we really need to get more vaccines and more arms and a better control of over the pandemic before we can um, fully lift all those other preventative measures. And, you know, specifically if your immune system is compromised, um, those measures can be very important at protecting you because they do okay. still reduce the amount of virus that can get into your portals of entry, which are your nose and mouth. Okay. Um, so just to clarify, the third dose has been approved in Quebec, right? Yeah. They, they, specifically in immunocompromised populations. Yep, they've, they've rolled it out in uh, hemodialysis and immune compromised populations. And then the individuals in long-term care facilities will be starting, uh, I believe in November. Okay. And and I suppose you can just do that through Clique Santé if you are a member of one of those immunocompromised populations, either talk to your doctor or, or check out Clique Santé, right? I imagine so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna read through the chat because we have about 12 questions that just came in. Um, are there any considerations or implications for anyone going through stem cell transplants in particular? Uh, ooh, that's a very broad question. <laughs> um, so yeah, if, if you can, before a transplant, if you can get the vaccine series completed at least two weeks before, um, it's probably ideal. Um, that said, if you're getting an allo stem cell transplant, there's going to be a, a lot of immunosuppression for a long period of time. So in those instances, the ongoing personal protective sort of measures, the good infection control measures, and having everyone around you fully vaccinated and, and, and taking the necessary precautions is the best way to prevent you from getting sick. And that's not just for COVID, that's for any virus um, during an, a hematologic malignancy allo stem cell transplant our immune system is at its absolute lowest um, and even a very mundane parainfluenza or rsv can make us incredibly incredibly ill um, so the best way to prevent against all the different infectious um, culprits that that might um, impair our ability to heal um, and, and while we reconstitute our immune system um, are really those infection control barriers that we put in place. And that's not only gonna protect, protect us from COVID, but everything else that's out there. Okay. Um, someone is just questioning, so they were double vaccinated but prior to cancer diagnosis and treatment. Um, and their oncologist was telling them to wait six months before their third vaccine. Um, based on your presentation, you're saying to wait three months. I would assume you're gonna tell us to follow the oncologist's guidelines. Is, um, tell me if you have any specific advice for this person. Yeah, so it depends what regimen they received. So the, okay. the, the NACI general statement is three months for immunosuppressions, um, but if you have any type of B cell, um, an agent that, that depletes your, your B cell function, um, or if, like it's it, six to 12 months. So a Retux uh, or any uh, monoclonal that might uh, impair B cell function. Okay. So it could just be that that individual did receive um, a, a treatment that included something like that. Um, or it could be that uh, there's other factors that we don't know about that the oncologist is privy to, um, in which case I would always defer to the oncologist and their, their understanding over um, a patient's immune system. Fair enough. Um, is the antibody cocktail therapy vaccine also available, like the non-mRNA vaccines? 
So it's not actually a vaccine. Um, so vaccine is something that tells our immune system how to create the antibodies and, and the cellular based immune response before we get uh, an infection. The monoclonal antibody cocktail, so that's like Regencov, um, that is something that we're, we're given after we have infection if we don't have any immune antibodies. So if we've never had COVID before, if we've not been fully vaccinated, um, and if we, uh, um, or if we have and we have no immune system, um, that's something after we get infection. So we're talking about prevention with vaccine versus treatment at the time that we get infection. So technically it is, it's something that we, could try to get here. It's not really mainstream in Canada yet. There's not a lot of it floating around. You have to go through special access. Um, the treatments are very delayed and the time to give it is, is a very short window. So usually very early on in infection. So we say within like the first week or so. So it's, um, it's not something that we've done locally and we don't have the capacity to do for mild outpatient illness uh, at present. Uh, but I know there is there are places in um, the province and in the city um, that are exploring this possibility for when um, we have access to this medication. Okay. Um, someone wrote in saying they live in a hot area for COVID and already have received a third dose. What about down the road? Like what can we anticipate at this point? Well, I, th I think um, when it comes to COVID, we never know down the road. Um, the information is constantly evolving with COVID. And, and I, I thank the patients, the endless patients of, of the population for understanding that. Because as we learn about the virus and, and how our immune system handles the vaccines over time, then we know what we need to do. But we're not going to know until down the road. Um, so uh unfortunately we we won't we don't have that that uh predictive ability yet <laughs> okay fair enough i'm getting lots of thank you very much merci beaucoup pour cette mise à jour uh great webinar thank you for this informative session um somebody wrote in saying if i'm still getting immunotherapy can i get the vaccine absolutely so anyone yes. it, there's no contraindication to give this vaccine for individuals that are immune compromised okay so, and still receive it. If there's someone with lymphedema in both arms, is is there any concern about getting vaccinated? Ooh, that's a good question. I would discuss that with your treating physician about the risk benefits of it. Um, certainly when you have significant lymphedema, any type of injections within that space can put you at higher risk for skin soft tissue infections. Um, okay. So it would be something I would have to that you would have to discuss. Okay. Um, somebody asked what the interval is between the second and third dose. What's the suggested interval? So it has to be more than 28 days. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's from what the the um, uh, FDA has has put out. Um, there is a four day grace period that they they speak about, but uh, in general, 28 days. Perfect. So that's the last question I saw come in. I'm going to um, put one more last call if anyone would like to submit a question in the chat. Uh, oh, there was one question further up. Let me just get back to it. Sorry. Um, are there any clinical trials testing vaccine efficacy and reduction of vaccine side effects in cancer patients undergoing genetic targeted therapies acting in their DNA, like PARP inhibitors? PRP oh, inhibitors. you know what? the the Immunosuppression is such a heterogeneous group, um, and there's so many different types of immunosuppression, so many different types of immunosuppressing agents and, and diseases that a lot of the data that we have right now is, is sort of a lump. It, it lumps all those individuals in all of their differences within the same uh, group based off of, of, of a predefined uh, definition, which includes multiple different conditions. So the complexity of one versus the other, I don't think that's being fully um, investigated in a way that would be to the, the rigor that uh, the person posing the question uh, would like, I imagine. Um, and it could also be because there's not uh, the, a sufficient um, 
sample size to really have a good idea of what the effects are um, with each individual type of immunocompromising condition or immunosuppressive therapy. Um, but certainly very interesting. And uh, there's a member of our group, Dr. Zaharatos, who has a, a huge interest in immunology. So if you want any specific questions about that, you can email me and I'll, I'll loop him into the conversation and see what he has to say. That's good to know. Thank you. There's one more question. If someone's chemo stopped working and they were about to start immunotherapy, should they think about getting a third dose before they start immunotherapy? So again, yeah, I would talk to, to your uh, oncologist about the best timing for that. Um, but if, if during that sandwich between the two, um, we can wait the three months, then that probably is to the advantage of your immune system, uh, particularly if the immunotherapy is targeted um, against uh, specific types of, of malignant cells versus different types of your, your actual immune system. So um, okay. that's something to discuss with them. I have two more questions here and then I'm gonna stop. Um, most of the strategies discussed are defensive. So getting the vaccine, wearing a mask, you know, two meter distance. How can we proactively boost our immunity with alternative methods? Um, and what do you have to say about our microbiome? Do you have any strategies in, related to this kind of uh, way of thinking? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know that we have any good robust data on how to proactively boost the immune system. I wish we did, because that would be very cool. Um, generally, the, the old adage of, of, you know, taking good care of one's health with good sleep hygiene, good diet, exercise, all of those things are just important for, for general health and well-being. And I think that all plays an important role. Um, specific sort of immune boosters, I know there's many um, natural red remedies that are on the market, um, but I don't, I have not seen any good data that supports um, one versus the other. With respect to our microbiome, if you are on antibiotics, um, then there is some data support taking probiotics to ensure that you have a microbiome that is um, diverse um, and not deplete. Um, and this certainly helps with the general homeostasis in multiple different uh, organ systems within your body and can help um, reduce symptoms of having uh, alterations in microbiome like uh, diarrhea or vaginitis um, and likely plays a role in terms of our, our immune response just because our mucosal uh, barriers interact with those pathogens at uh, all the time. So um, I'm sure any type of you know, microbiome boosters that, that we take are, are, are going to be useful, but also keep in mind that um, certain types of immune compromising conditions and when there's breakdown of our mucosal barriers, if we take these oral agents, we can be at risk of uh, infections related to those agents. And we have seen those in very profoundly immunocompromised individuals. So it's a, a risk benefit ratio, but those are, I guess, all good, but very like grandma, Pro proactive <laughs> uh, recommendations. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, last question, which I think we've already answered, um, but independent of the irritation of the skin and lymphedema, is it okay to have the vaccine? And the message was, I guess, talk to your oncologist, eh? Yes. Yeah, okay, perfect. I think we got it all. Dr. Parks, thank you so much for your time and for your knowledge and wisdom. It was so wonderful to have you here. Um, if anyone would like, you can use your reactions at the bottom of the screen to give a little applause. Um, and uh, I just want to wish everyone a wonderful afternoon. And this, uh, this presentation is recorded, so we will have it available later on. So thank you again, Dr. Parks, and have a, have a great day. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very, very much.